following program is intended for mature audiences. The time is now for the hardest hit, yet completely trivial, football show on the planet. You are in rarefied territory. Ladies and gentlemen, well, well to the broken helmet. Let's rock. Wow. Just when you think nothing can happen on a Monday. Holy fucking shit. And I'm saying this flat out as a New York Giants fan. Yes, every week my brother and I come on here. Sometimes I come on here more than he does here and there to spout NFL football, gambling, lines, the rest of it. At times I try to do a Thursday night recap here and there when I had the time. Wish I had done more. But hey, you got to crawl before you walk. But anyway, before I derail, the broken helmet is usually talking about football in general or specifically gambling. And I have to veer from that normal course of content in order to talk about Dave Gettleman because as mentioned in the podcast I am a New York Giant fan 44 years old have been a Giant fan for quite a while and really felt a attachment to the team if you will Not because I am clueless as to how professional sports work. No, I worked in professional sports or sports industry for about 10 years out of college. So I know in the end it really is uh, just chasing your tail unless you are a, a player, an agent, a owner, or somebody that rips uh, significant dollars from the industry. If you are not one of those people and you are investing your time and effort trying to work or become part of the industry, uh, I, I, I can't say anything. I, I got no. I don't know what to tell you. It, it, you're chasing a dream. Uh, you're better off doing stuff like this, like a podcast, and getting your rocks off just, you know, Venting your frustrations or praise one way or the other uh, rather than pursuing careers in sports. So that said, I do feel an attachment to the Giants because I like them. I like Giant fandom. Um, I like, you know, watching games with other people. But I do not think that in any way, shape or form that the Merritt and Tish family can be flying fuck about Rich Eggie. I, I, I get it. All right. So that said, uh, Dave Gettleman. Today on, I guess, uh, well, it's after 12 now, so we are looking at January 4th, currently the 5th, it just got re-signed to do another year of general management for the New York football giants. I mean, I'm not, I'm not shitting you here. They just re-signed them. I mean, I guess you re-sign players, but in this sense, Dave Gettleman has inked or has kept his contract to come on and do yet another year of general management for the New York football giants. And where do we begin? I really don't fucking know, to be completely honest, because... It um, It's kind of baffling. It's kind of baffling to think that the Maras and Tish families gave the thumbs up to an individual who has really shown no, no skill at being said general manager. At least not of the Giants. You want to talk about the Panthers? I don't know. 
I'm not a Panther fan, and I'm not going back and diving into all David Gettleman history of the Panthers. It's already been done, not to mention. I'm not going to waste my personal time digging up Panther shit. I will talk about the Giants. It's relevant to me, and I paid attention to it a little bit, so I have a little bit more information on that. Um, I don't understand what he has done to warrant yet another year of employment on this franchise. Especially, especially given his track record at building the roster, which is the number one, number one job of the general manager, is to build the roster. And the roster he has continually thrown out on the field is pretty much the equivalent to the little fucking alien baby that came out of the guy's chest in the 1979 Classic. And I reference that because it's on HBO as I speak right now. But it is metaphorically similar. Because this guy throws up this just monstrosity year after year that just continually grows and grows and becomes a bigger nightmare as the season goes on. Sure, this year, I I don't know. This year, the fan base was ultimately teased because they played in a shitbox division and were able to take a 5-10 and 10 record into the final week of the season and have a shot to win the division and make the playoffs. I mean, I, I, no shit. 5-10 and 10 and you could have won the division. And for some reason, that deserves a round of applause and a, another year guiding this roster. I'm sorry. I don't see it. I don't see it at all. And I've read all the tweets, social media articles that Joe Jez loves them. They're, uh, you know, uh, uh, what the, I I wanted to use a fucking word. Um, Simpatico? Simpatico? I don't know. It's from a movie. I can't remember what it is. (laughs) That the two of them are simpatico together, and that's not the word. Ah, fuck off. Um, (laughs) <laughs> that these two guys are on the same wavelength. And because Joe Judge, a first year coach who finished six and ten, six and ten, mind you, it because they are on the same wavelength and a first year coach who went six and ten really likes him, they're gonna keep him for another year. I mean what the flying fuck? <laughs> what? What? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me what needs to happen. Each year, as each offseason, we just sit here and wait for Gettleman to make the moves, to change this roster, to put us in a better position than we were the year before. And each year it's... And then again. And then again. We're waiting for the big party at the end of the rainbow yet it never comes and it never comes and so I have sat just flapping my gums and making over generalizations without actually talking any content about said Dave Gettleman so uh, all right let's just start then why not right it can't hurt Where do we want to chalk this up? Do we want to chalk it up with the head coaching hires? Do we want to go that route? Or do we want to go with the drafts and the free agents? I uh, let's let's go drafts, free agents, right? So because regardless of the coach that you bring in, you're going to be providing that coach the players that they're gonna want to use, right? And if the coach doesn't work out, you're still gonna have those players. So, those players are yours. They're not the coaches. Which, again, it it begs the question, 
why the Joe Judge, Dave Gettleman, uh, you know, mental connection is really that important. Because, I mean, in all honesty, if the key here is making Joe Judge happy and he likes Gettleman, just give Judge the keys to the castle and let him be the GM too. But anyway, so 2018 comes along. Gettleman gets hired as the general manager. And as I'm saying, he's the one responsible for the draft. So regardless of these players, I mean, regardless of the coach, I should say, These players are going to be with the team for an extended period of time. Hopefully their entire rookie contract, maybe an extended fifth year, and maybe longer than that. So let's knock off Pat Shermer for right now. And so for 2018, let's just look at the draft. And let's look at the draft, and I've done this 8 million different ways over the years. I found an article that did it one pick after, and it's really easy to digest. So let's just do it this way. We're going to look Giants and one pick after, right? So obviously we understand Eli's at the end of his rope and they go ahead and they pick Saquon Barkley, right? Saquon had a phenomenal, phenomenal rookie season. I think he had 1,300 yards and what, 700 yards receiving on 91 catches. I mean, it was a phenomenal rookie season and he looked great. Problem was... As everybody knows, they needed a quarterback. This has been chopped up eight ways from Sunday. Um, Is that a saying eight ways from Sunday? I think it is. Uh, In 44 years, I I should have heard it and known that more, uh, whether it was or was not a saying to use it. But, eh, you know, multiple degrees and, uh, you know, not a lot of IQ to go behind. I I don't know what to make of it, but eight ways from Sunday. Uh, That's what we're going with. So, anyway, if Barkley gets selected in this spot after him is Darnold. Darnold has not proven to be uh, a excellent prospect. I don't really know what to make of him, to be completely honest. When the pick was made and Darnold was on the board, I thought the surefire bet was to go get Darnold. That's who I wanted. Barkley looked good in his first year, but again, the track for a rookie in terms of contract is... Four years, and and this was all all defined by Le'Veon Bell. So you knew exactly what you were going to get. And it has been shown time and time again to be the case with Ezekiel Elliott, Alvin Kamara, um, who else am I forgetting here? Uh, Ed McCaffrey. It's become a running back because of the cliff they fall off after their fifth year, the running back ends up being a three-year rookie deal with a renegotiation going into year four. That's what has happened. That bar was set by Zeke, and it is followed by Kamara and McCaffrey. You play three years, and then you redo your contract on the threat of a holdout. By the way, at the end of uh, 2020, now into 2021, Barkley has successfully finished his third year, even though he didn't really play a year because he blew his fucking knee out. So, Barkley gets signed here. Then after that, we have Hernandez. I don't know. Okay. Hasn't developed really all that much. If anything, he's had a down year this year compared to his second year. So, he's no pro bowler by any stretch of the means. And he's a second rounder to boot. Lorenzo Carter, nobody knows still what to make of him, and nobody knew what to make of him before his injury this year, and now nobody knows what to make of him next year because he lost the year. B.J. Hill, great. Defensive lineman, serviceable. Solid? Sure. Great? No. Next, Kyle Laletta. Remember that fucking guy? Remember him? He was going to be the fourth-round pick that uh, supplanted Eli. The only problem was that he wasn't a great quarterback, and he liked to run over uh, police officers in the middle of the fucking road. So they were directing traffic down in Weehawken or uh, whatever. Weehawken or I think it was Weehawken. I think it was. I used to work at UBS, and I used to drive home, and I think I used to drive through the same intersection. I knew exactly what was going on. But anyway, I think it was Weehawken. Uh, it could have been Hoboken, whatever it was. But Mr. Loletta decided to uh, basically drive over a cop. Um, uh, RJ McIntosh, again, okay, fine. Uh, 
he didn't even, you know, no stats this year, didn't play this year, uh, has come along, has been on the roster, and I mean nothing. So, uh, in, in his first year, he didn't even play because he had, uh, what, a stomach ailment or he had some kind of physical illness ailment and he couldn't even play and he had to go in, into the draft and they still drafted him anyway. And, oh, my God. It, it, it is enough yeah, to make yeah. a fucking head spin. And then they go into the supplemental draft after that and they pick up Sam Beal. Sam Beal. Did, you know, not Allie McBeal, uh, n- not any other Beal that you might know. Sam Beal. And not Sam Neal, uh, not uh, you know, uh, Ted Danson's guy from Cheers. Who the hell was that? Uh, his name was Sam, right? His name was Sam something. So, but Sam Beal, supplemental, they give up a third rounder in the following draft to get this guy. He's got a bum shoulder going into the draft which they then say they knew about only after he blows his fucking shoulder out and misses his entire rookie year. Uh, Sam Malone. Boom. Gotcha. Money. Sam Malone. So he's not, uh, you know, Ally McBeal. He's not Sam Malone. He's Sam Beal. And he has amounted to nothing. And then to boot, he opted out in COVID. No shit. Opted out. Whew. That, my friends, is 2018. Let's go to the picks after those. After Barkley, Sam Darnold. After Hernandez, Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb. So flip it the other way around, and the Giants could have had Darnold and Chubb instead of Barkley and Hernandez. Guess what? Would have been an infinitely better situation that the case. Uh, Lorenzo Carter was followed by Chad Thomas. That guy playing for the Browns. He's not even in the league right now. B.J. Hill. Hmm. B.J. Hill. Okay. Solid. Who was after him? Fred fucking Warner. Are you fucking retarded? Nah, can you believe it? Fred Warner. Fred Warner over B.J. Hill. Wet takes for nothing! Fred Warner is a pro bowler and is fucking ill at linebacker. B.J. Hill is... Serviceable. Serviceable. Uh, and then after that, I a whole bunch of crap. But that's 2018. So there you go, David Gettleman. Solid 2018. 2019, we start off with the Danny Dimes disaster. <gasps> Sixth pick of the draft. Sixth pick when you had Darnold available the year before. And in this one, this was the year that they had the picks, they had cap space, blah, blah, blah. Danny Dimes gets selected, and everybody's head spinning because nobody can understand what it was. Now, people talked after the fact about how Washington wanted him, this team wanted him, he never would have made it, whatever the case is. The point is that when you're drafting the quarterback from Duke University, Wake Forest Demon Deacon, so fuck Duke. But from Duke University, what kind of game tape and what kind of, I don't know, career are, do you have on display that warrants the sixth pick in the NFL draft? Because Danny Dimes didn't have it. He didn't have it. I mean, he had Potential. Potential. And I get it. Ah, draft is all about potential, Rich. What do you fucking know? Uh, yeah, sure, fine. It is all potential, and the, the draft is a crapshoot. But at number six, if you're going to piss away a draft pick on a quarterback, on a team that is pretty, at the time, devoid of talent, with an aging quarterback, you better be goddamn sure that that quarterback is going to be something. Something that you can work with. And from everything that we've seen, it seems like it was almost a lotto pick. It seemed like it was a couple of people said, ah, you know, we like him. He's got some potential, and we think we can work with him. But outside of that, there was no surefire anything in that pick. They come back with Dexter Lawrence, okay? Congratulations. Dexter Lawrence is awesome. Fantastic pick. 
So you got that one on your back. But guess what? You come back, you come back, and you trade up. You trade up to go back up into the first round. And then you sign DeAndre, it was signed. You draft DeAndre Baker. That guy is a disgrace to the uniform. Fucking A right, Mike. So this guy, not only does he suck his entire freshman year in the NFL, rookie season, whatever. He's terrible. He gets called out for having a bad attitude. Goes into the offseason, gets involved in allegedly a loaded dice game to which he then follows up by basically pulling guns and taking his money back allegedly which then leads to cops arrests kicked off the team only to have everything expunged because the lawyers on the other side ended up getting greedy and wanted guaranteed money to drop the case and then that guy, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, just got fucking arrested. And the whole case got thrown out. DeAndre Baker then goes and <laughs> he gets signed by the Kansas City Chiefs onto their practice squad, gets pulled up last week, and then in uh, the final week of the season ends up basically breaking his leg in half. Obviously a major malfunction. <laughs> you would say. It snapped. It was gross. I uh, feel bad for anybody uh, that suffers a big injury like that. But at some point, you're gonna, somebody's going to make the karma joke there, right? So anyway, that was the that was the trade up into the first round was to draft that guy. Because remember, the reason that we're going through this and we're 20 minutes into this so far is that we're trying to account for why David Gettleman has been given the keys to the Giants' castle for yet another year. And we're now uh, a couple of picks into his second draft ever. Follow DeAndre Baker is X-Man, who, I don't know. He's never been used correctly. Who knows how to use him? And then he blows out his rotator cuff and ends up missing the entire rest of the 2020 season. So you lose out on seeing whatever the X-Man was going to be as he loses his second year to injury. Follow that, you have Julian Love, who wasn't good enough to be a cornerback, so they moved into safety, and he's not good enough to be a safety either. So what the fuck is Julian Love? We still don't know. But he is a Golden Domer. Woo! Yay! Notre Dame! Whatever. Notre Dame, can you do anything in the bowls ever? I mean, I, we all get it. You have a massive following his, because of historic relevance, I guess. But... I mean, your teams have never been competitive in the postseason, ever. Ever. And now they're giving you unwarranted bowl games just because of your following, which is complete bullshit. <laughs> so I'm I'm happy that you guys got blown out of the water. And the next time that happens, fans and media should raise holy hell because there was no way that Notre Dame should have been in either of those playoff games. They weren't one of the top four teams, and they didn't deserve to be in it, but they wanted the fans, and so that's what all of America got. Uh, enough with the Golden Domers, because oh, we're talking about professional football here, and I just got sidetracked because Julian Love is a Golden Domer, who also, I mean, he's, he doesn't suck. I can't rail on him that bad. But anyway, not solid. Ryan Connolly. Okay, I will give Ryan Connolly a ding because he was good and he was a great pick late. However, tours ACL and then for whatever reason, and if you want to start building on Dave Gettleman's garbage GM plays, they, they don't even ride him out. They just cut him. And so then he goes to Minnesota, and he didn't really do anything in Minnesota this year. Um, you can look. I, I mean, you know, I, he only had a couple of snaps going into the end of the season. So, you know, I, I guess I, I don't know, good move by cutting him because he didn't look like he turned around. But why wouldn't you just keep him on the roster and try to build with him? 
Uh, who knows? Maybe you never hear from Ryan Connolly again, but man, he looked good through a couple of games until that knee injury. And it would be surprising if uh, an ACL injury to a second-year player was enough to discredit all the other positives that you saw from him in the limited time he was on the field last year. So that was a ding, even though, who knows, injury, what ultimately happens to him as a talent. The next one is a definite ding. I'll give it two. Darius Slayton is great. The only problem with Darius Slayton is he's not a number one, but he's great for where you got him, right? And he has big play potential. Unfortunately, I don't know if we've actually seen what Darius Slayton could potentially become because I think it's completely hinged on Daniel Jones and his mediocre performance on the field. If it was other quarterbacks, I think Slayton would have better stats. I I don't know that for a fact. I just... It's tough to think that wide receivers, because it, look, wide receivers are a weird, are weird birds, right? They are either consistently productive, flash in the pan, big hit threats. I think that Slayton could be a routine production guy. I don't know if he would be, you know number one top tier talent but when you put Slayton up against Sterling Shepard I'd rather see Slayton featured than Shepard I just think we know what Shepard is and we don't know what Slayton is yet but I think he's got the higher upside I'm gonna give a double ding there for because from where they got him which was super late he was phenomenal and then we have Corey Ballantyne so and I don't know What else you can say about that? So, through two drafts, these are the names. Barkley, Hernandez, Lorenzo Carter, P.J. Hill, Kyle Aletta, R.J. McIntosh, Sam Beal, Danny Dimes, Dexter Lawrence, DeAndre Baker, X-Man, Julian Love, Ryan Connolly, Darius Slayton, Corey Ballantyne. Time. Whatever. Uh, Now, we come up to 2020, and we start right off with... Andrew Thomas. You are a stupid asshole. That's exactly what he is. Now, Andrew Thomas is not a stupid asshole, Ron. But David Gettleman for sure is. Because you have your pick of the litter on all four of these... All four of these tackles. And you went with Thomas. Who many felt was a reach. Got in there. Now, whether it was, you know, whether it was Mark Colombo uh, and his teaching, whatever it might have been, Andrew Thomas did not turn the corner. Look like he didn't even get into the starting gate. He was horrific. All year long. And others... I mean, you got Becton, who is in New York, too, and you get to see. And he's just a monster of a man. And uh, Wilf uh, down in Tampa was solid. But we get Thomas, and maybe an offseason, a different approach, maybe a move back to the opposite side, maybe it's placement. Who knows? But it didn't reap any benefits in 2020 and didn't do any good for anybody. Xavier McKinney, uh, jury's still out. He got hurt. What are you going to do? But let's just run down the rest of these guys. Matt Pearl, Danny Holmes, Shane Lemieux, I'd rather have Mario, Cam Brown, Carter Coughlin, TJ Brunson, Chris Williamson, and Tay Crowder. The point with the rest of the 2020 draft class is... They're just guys. Maybe they develop into something down the road, but they're just guys. And so through three drafts of the David Gettleman vision, you have basically gotten Barkley, Dexter Lawrence, Slayton as the three knock-em-out-of-the-parks. 
Hernandez, serviceable. Ryan Connolly had potential. Xavier McKinney, question mark. And that's it. And that's what you've gotten through three through three drafts. Now, now, let's blow the whistle and head over to free agency. <sighs> Boy, strap in. Strap in, motherfucker. First, Jonathan Stewart. That's right, Jonathan Stewart. Do you remember that name? He signed him. He brought him in here. He did shit. Then you had Odell Beckham. Because if you have forgotten about that fiasco, they sign him and they give him $40 million, but we didn't sign him to trade him. Didn't sign him to trade him. Here's your guarantee. And then they shopped him. Not only did they sign him, not to trade him, but then ultimately trade him, they also shopped him without shopping him. You had teams across the NFL, across the NFL, that wanted him and never even knew he was available. Suck him, motherfucker! Because... Other people could have had him. And people could have given you more than the first round pick than you got from the Browns. But instead, for whatever reason, you decided, David Gettleman, to not shop him around. I didn't expect that at all. Nobody did. Because if you had an asset such as OBJ, who I will say I thought he was good for three to four wins each year on the old Giants team. His playmaking ability, I thought, was good for three to, uh, you know, three to four wins. Alone. That's how good he was. And you didn't even bother to shop it. So you signed him for one year, and then you got him out of town. Congratulations. Nate Solder. Look. Look. You needed offensive line help, and you signed Solder for big money. Can't really get on you for that. But I think we can all agree it didn't really work out in anybody's favor. Solder is average at best. But at the time, you needed somebody, and he was on the market. And that's the way free agency goes. That's just part of the game. You can't really harp on the Nate Solder signing. You can harp on... Uh, Jalapio and Amame because you brought in those two slapdicks and they amounted to nothing. Nothing. And who the hell knows what you saw in either of them to give them contracts. And if people have two years out forgotten about this whole disaster, this was the revamped line. The Hog Mollies. Oh, remember we are the Hog Mollies? And we're going to rebuild the Hog Mollies. And everybody kept talking about Hog Mollies and Hog Mollies and Hog Mollies. It's about to get all stupid up in here! I, I, I don't even know what the fuck a Hog Molly is. I think it's a fish. I think it's a fish. I'm not quite sure, but I think it's a fish. And for some reason, Dave Gettleman has taken this term and applied it to linemen with his feeling that oh, we like big, big, big men in the front offensive line and the back defensive line. We like the big men on the line. Whatever, you fucking dummy. So the thought process was to revamp the whole line and let Barkley run for 3,000 yards and, you know, Manning go back to his peak prime performance because we were just a line away from all of that taking place. And it was going to be Barkley and OBJ and and uh, Eli all behind the hog mollies. And it all amounted to shit because Amame and Jalapeno... See ya. They brought Jalapio back this year. I, you know, he wasn't even on the roster at the end of the year. I think they cut him. I, I stopped keeping track. They traded for Alec Ogletree. I'm not kidding you. They traded for Alec Ogletree. 
and we all know what happened there. Now, the question you have to ask yourself when you're talking about Alex Ogletree, if there are any IDP fantasy football players out there, they'll all remember Ogletree from the year before the Giants signed him because he had monster tackle numbers. However, the Rams, who had him going into that offseason, did not even bother to bring him back. And one must ask themselves, why on God's green earth would an inside backer that had monster tackle numbers not be wanted by the team that currently had him? And as we all saw on tape, it was because he couldn't cover anyone. He was that bad in coverage. And then, on top of being that bad, he got old and slow real, real quick. Super quick! Super quick. Like, Rich Eisen running the 40. Slow as shit. So, you trade for Alex Ogletree. Then you get the Leonard Williams trade. Okay, Leonard Williams... Phenomenal player. The trade was absolutely horrific because you end up trading a third plus, third plus, multiple picks. The, I mean, the prime piece was the third for the rights to sign him, basically, because he was going to be an unrestricted free agent. So, You tag him instead. You get him. He doesn't really do anything last year. You tag him, and then you're going to have to pay him 16 mil. What ultimately happens this year is that he plays end, does awesome, and now he just hit the jackpot. Because they'll go to arbitration, they'll get him moved and qualified as a defensive end. And so his $16 million franchise tag this year is going to be infinitely more next year if you choose to tag him. And if you don't choose to tag him, you're going to have to pay him DN money. Or you're just going to have to let him walk for a third and, what was it, fourth and a fifth? Whatever the hell it was. So... Player, phenomenal. The trade, so ill-conceived. I, 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 when it happened, I couldn't believe it. And now, a year later, a year and a half later, I still can't fathom how poor a decision it was to trade for him. Because you gave up multiple picks... To pay a free agent you could have done anyway. You could have kept. You could have kept your picks. And still given Williams all the money you're going to give him now. The other option you have is just to let Williams go. And then you got nothing out of the couple of years that you had him other than the draft picks that you lost in order to put him in a uniform for a couple of years. Fantastic. Fantastic. You give Peppers and Ingram their fifth-year contracts for their rookie deal. Peppers, good. Uh, obviously got in the trade for OBJ. Solid, better in run than in pass. Has seen nothing out of Peppers in terms of his uh, college potential specifically punt returns, big plays, anything. I mean, he's just a serviceable defensive player. Uh, Good in run defense, better in run defense probably than pass. I mean, equivalent to Landon Collins, maybe. And Ingram, I mean, we all understand that Ingram is, uh, I mean, he's just a conundrum. Uh, What do you do with him? Uh, at, At his peak, he has a skill set that is game-breaking and invaluable. And at his worst, he doesn't block and drops balls all over the place. So what do you do with that? What do you do with an NFL player that is consistently inconsistent? What you do is you just let him go. 
Re, you re-signed Marcus Golden going into this year. Uh, you got him on the cheap. No knock there. But ultimately, you just got rid of him anyway. And he went back to Arizona. More on Arizona and Marcus Golden and James Betcher later. You did sign Logan Ryan. Congratulations. You traded for Isaac Yadam. Uh, I don't know. I, you know, again, serviceable. Played a ton. Uh, great. No. But you traded nothing away to get him, so whatever. You brought in Dion Lewis, whose best years were so far behind him that even given the chance, and when you just needed him to do a little bit this year, he did absolute nothing. Nothing. And you can go and watch the game tape. I, I mean, it looked like a player who was so far from the dynamic days in New England that it would be difficult to understand how y- you couldn't see it coming. I don't know. I, I At the time, I thought it was okay. And then you saw it on the gridiron, and it really didn't look good. But again, you have to have some kind of network in the NFL and be able to shoulder tap some people to tell you whether or not the player that you're looking at is available for a reason or not. You probably could have done the same for the trade of Alec Ogletree, but you could have done it, I would think, easier here for Deion Lewis because there, there had to be somebody. Somebody along the line that just been like, hey, look, you know, he worked out great in New England, but he's done. Golden Tate. So, first year was phenomenal. And it has been a struggle ever since. At the time, this Golden Domer, another Golden Domer, was all right. I did not understand the signing at the time, again, because this team was not a player or two away from the Super Bowl. So, to bring him in and give him a big contract only to watch him take that money and fade into the sunset didn't make a whole lot of sense, and that's exactly what happened. Kyler Fackrell came on. He is a one-dimensional defensive player. He had moments where he flashed, but overall, I don't know. Again, I'm not going to give kudos to that signing. It was just a bit player. And then you finally have two... Phenomenal pickup in Blake Martinez and James Bradbury. And can't say enough about either of them. I originally thought Corey Littleton was the way to go for the linebacker. Blake Martinez has been really, really good. And James Bradbury has been such a steal. It, I mean, shutdown corners are hard to come by much less when you can find one the way that Gettleman did with Bradbury. Uh, Granted, came from Carolina, whatever it is, he pinned this guy to the team. And Bradbury plus Martinez and the defensive line that is nothing but money and assets is the reason that the Giants were 6-10 this year. It was all Bradbury... This D-line, and then Martinez running around on the field. Not a great defense by any stretch of the means, but you had performances from a couple of guys and a D-line that really, I I mean, it should have been that good because you had invested so many assets in it. It should have been good. You dump that much into one position. It should have been good. So, those are the free agents to follow the draft picks. And so, for those, you have Leonard Williams, who you're going to have to pay a ton of money, Logan Ryan, Blake Martinez, James Bradbury. You want to throw in Zeitler in the trade? I don't know. Uh, Peppers, I guess. But that's it. So, you're looking... At Barkley, Hernandez, Dexter Lawrence, Slayton, 
Leonard Williams, Logan Ryan, Blake Martinez, James Bradbury. Out of, you know, I can't even tell you how many players this is that I'm looking at here. But let's say 6 times 3, 18, plus another 10 here, you know. Say 30-plus players, and you're looking at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 out of 30? Wow. Wow. So, let's get off the players, and let's wrap this up talking about the coaches. Because this is also another part of it here. And... The part I want to talk about isn't necessarily Joe Judge because Joe Judge has only had one year. But the two years with Pat Shermer had so many flaws in it that, again, combining this with the free agents plus the draft picks make it really tough tough to stomach the fact that Dave Gettleman got yet another year with the New York Giants. Because... The thing about Pat Shermer is he came in and his offense was so bad, was so bad that it didn't make any sense to draft what you were drafting based on the approach your coach, who was the offense coordinator, well, in a sense, Shula, but it was Shermer, was going to take on the field. You know, you're getting ingredients for, you know, chicken cacciatore and the coach is trying to make a pizza. And the end product is shit. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And that's what ended up happening with Pat Shermer. And it happened on both sides of the ball. Because when they signed James Betcher and his defense in Arizona came here the biggest question year one was it's a 3-4 defense but that's not the pieces that we currently have and not many people run the 3-4 defense that Betcher was running So if you make the move over to a 3-4 from the 4-3 which they had, are you going to redo your entire roster to to, to staff that defensive squad? And if you make all the free agent moves and defensive signings and draft picks to fill this 3-4 defense and it doesn't work out, What do you do at the back end when you have to bring in another coach? And you bring in a whole new approach when you just flip the roster to cater to this defense coordinator. That's what happened. Betcher didn't work out. His defense was terrible. And they have a mixed mosh of defense, which they basically tried to overhaul twice in three years. And you have players like Marcus Golden, who came in, had one good year, and then re-signed. After having that good year, they couldn't do anything with them. They got rid of them, and they sent them back to Arizona. I mean, the things, the shit just didn't make sense. It didn't make sense. And this was all under Gettleman's watch. So now, because Joe Judge and Gettleman have had a season-long meeting of the minds and seem to be compatible. I've read the word compatible several times today in articles about these two. That you should be absolved of all of your prior fuck-ups in order to have your job for 2021. I don't understand it. 
as a Giant fan. Fifty fifty minutes into this talking to myself, I still don't understand it. And I, I feel pretty good about the case I made not to understand it because it shouldn't be happening. <laughs> it shouldn't be happening. It's that simple. There are other there are other G and you knew you know what? You knew this was gonna happen. You knew this shit was gonna happen when they didn't fire him earlier in the year. You knew it. You knew it because the the approach to take if you wanted a GM and you were the Giants was in the beginning of the year when everything was going to shit, you should have just blown out Gettleman and you started should have started interviewing candidates before anybody could. And when other teams ended up firing their GMs and then they started interviewing you knew the Giants were staying put because they had lost the advantage. They had lost the advantage that was in the palm of their hands to interview for GMs before anybody else could. And once you lost that advantage, you knew they were going to keep them. I was hoping it wasn't going to be the truth, but that's exactly what happened. And so they kept them. And so here we are. And the real blame for this whole thing goes to the Maras and the Tish family. If you want John Mara, because everybody says that he's the one driving this car. And I feel like the Gettleman year he's going to give him here is going to drive it right off the cliff. Because what you're going to have is you're going to have Barkley and his contract coming up. You're going to have Leonard Williams and his contract coming up. You're going to have David Tomlinson and his contract coming up. You're going to have Hernandez after that. You have Danny Dimes after that. Plus whatever free agents that you got to go out and get. And I don't see how you're going to be able, given the salaries that are coming up and the lack of talent from the past three years of drafts, how you're going to be able to put a good football team on the field in two years. I think Joe Judge has potential. I've said potential maybe 50 times in this podcast. My apologies. I'll have to get the thesaurus before I do my next solo podcast. But um, I, Joe Judge is okay. He could be good. He seems to understand the concept of culture. You know, go listen to the GM Shuffle. Mike Lombardi, and you'll hear culture, 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 and culture. I tend to agree with it. I tend to believe in it as well. Um, And Joe Judge seems to have a good culture of brewing. So you can't get too hard on Joe Judge. I just don't know what he's going to be able to do with the ingredients in the shopping bag. Because to me, it seems pretty limited. And whatever they do have is going to end up dialing up a pretty penny in the next coming years. And that's all because of Dave Gettleman. And Dave Gettleman is there because John Mara allows him to be there. And if we've seen anything over the past 15 years with the Giants, it is that John Mara does not like to pull the trigger when he should. He's a day late and a dollar short consistently. And that has punished this franchise with the exception of two tremendous, 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 whatever, tremendous NCAA-like runs for Super Bowls in 08 and 11. And outside of those two runs, the teams were basically worthless. And they, you know, fumbled around 500 and playoffs and consistently got mediocre draft picks and never bettered their stock. A couple players here and there. And they should have pulled the trigger on Coughlin and Reese way earlier. And Merritt let him go. And then he let Reese just pop off and throw bad money after bad money in his final year there. And give contracts to all these people who didn't believe, didn't deserve it. Only to fire 
Coughlin for a completely unproven Ben McAdoo. And then hamstring McAdoo by not letting him get rid of Eli, even though McAdoo had all kinds of other problems himself. And that all, that all was at the directive of John Mayer. And now here we sit. So strap in, Giants fans. Strap in. Because we have yet another year of Dave Gettleman coming up and his tremendous draft ability. And what are we going to do? We're going to watch some shit. T draft picks. And then they're going to play like crap on the field. And we're all going to laugh about it in another year when he gets resigned for yet another contract. And they're going to say that him and Joe Judge think alike. And that's why he gets to go another year. And I ran out of shit to say. So peace out. David Gettleman sucks. The big one. Bye. Peace out. Talk to you later this week with my brother when we do the lines. Fuck Dave Gillen.